I was I visited uh, Professor Reese's 107 course this morning, and I see some familiar faces from that essay, that attempt. Um, and I was saying to the class that I've been writing sort of double sonnets that don't necessarily rhyme according to any convention, but uh, double sonnets with a curtailed line. So instead of a five beat line, these are four beats. So really, just a 28 line poem. <laughs> why, why make it sound more complicated than that? <clears throat> Walking into the distance, Midsummer in the path in the woods is dark. I cannot see its end, or rather what I know to be its sudden fading at the fence before an unkempt, lonely field. I cannot see the other end when I look back, midway on the walk I've taken, stepping slowly. There must be something on my mind but I prefer to notice how the sugar maples have dispersed themselves, the buckeyes and the beach, and soon, though longer for me, the poplars will tower over the other trees. The recurring dream I've had for years is to imagine the great trees, and I've imagined there might be a moral purpose to such a dream. Sensual, decadent beauty presenting itself completely with bugs for music, and a butterfly insanely flapping its dun wings until it snaps back to freedom from the harmless thread a spider left, silently recomposes itself as if nothing symbolic has happened to float farther into this moment that has forever living in it. I thought I'd share too um, what may become a larger project. I've, uh, <clears throat> partly from teaching for a long time now, and partly from just the pleasures I take in casually reading a wide array of poetry from poetry published last week to poems from 600 years ago or so. Um, I, I've gotten, ex this will sound very nerdy, I, I get excited about a really good line. Even if the rest of the whole poem doesn't hold together, if it's got a good line in it, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, and so I just started, shall we say, collecting good lines from other poems and allowing them to serve as a title for a poem that I write. And so this poem I'm going to read, I think I have three of these. This is called the title, Partly to Think, More to be Left Alone. And the, the title comes from a line in an Edwin Arlington Robinson poem called The Book of Annandale which is a tedious, long-winded poem itself, but this particular line I really liked. <clears throat> and, and my little assignment that I've given myself is, I'm not trying to respond to the parent poem here, I'm just letting the, the line that I've lifted just kind of suggest my own poem. Partly to think and more to be left alone, I was sitting mildly in the shade of a hedge apple tree and the stranger cooler shade of contemplation that asks the mind to reach beyond its ordinary fiddling. I got a pretty good impression of the tree with thorns like rooster spurs or meaningful commas plotting the sense of the mute far-reaching branches Branches not unlike the mind, growing in strange direction, even into the withering dark, to think there must be something to say for growing this way, or something the dark itself is saying 
to draw the mind away from the easier way it could have gone. And the commas prick along the branches, allowing one to read them by touch, as if the tree is speaking, or the language of the tree is there, in elegant, repeatable phrases, stretching and drooping to say itself. This, uh, I can't remember if I mentioned this in Professor Lisa's class this morning, but until, I'll just share this with you youngsters, until I was a junior in college, I didn't think people still wrote poetry. I thought poetry was dead. But it died with T.S. Eliot and Robert Frost and uh, blacksmithing and horse and buggies. I, I, it just, it, because of the way I had been exposed to poetry in school, it, it, it seemed like it was an antique. And I was a junior in college before I met a living poet. And her name was Denise Levertov, who, if you, have, if you get to meet a living poet, she was a good one to meet. <coughs> um, and so this is a, is a uh, line that I borrowed from her poem called O oh, Taste and See. And the line is hungry and plucking the fruit. Either I dreamed it whole or now after many years I see it and understand the significance of the scene under the tree as if the perspective of being below the skirt of elegant green magnolia bloom produced a hum I chose to hum inside myself until it was time for me to hear it. On that day, however, probably a morning, first there was a woman's finger silently calling me out to her and then my face against her knee. And soon after that tenderness, I was asleep in her single bed, halfway under a quilt I recall was backed with satin or something soft. This is uh, the last of these that are kind of borrowing from previous poets. And uh, this line is taken from a really wonderful Robert Hayden poem called A Rogue in Kentucky. And uh, it's not in his greatest hits collection, but if you, I recommend you uh, look at this little poem of his. It's not quite a sonnet, but it's in the ballpark. Um, and the line that I've borrowed, I think, is the last line from his poem. So dark and so dark in the briary light. Isn't that a great, that's a great line. Passion once meant suffering, the human condition and all of that, on the way to becoming transfigured by the grace of unaccountable love. The metaphor of walking all of life symbolically alone through woods with little light appears to be a common way to describe this, ne this, this necessary passion. But I suppose other descriptions also explain the little walk we take. I took it last night in a dream and I was walking through a cave and real rocks were in the way. So I moved them aside and squeezed myself through a passage into morning life. That was the end of the dream. I may have blinked my eyes in disbelief or noticed I was finally free or had another epiphany, but something was there to lead me out. For the moment, I'll call it passion. mentioned to the uh, undergraduates I met with this morning that <coughs> for me I, I write by ear I walk around wherever I'm happen to be working and I talk out the lines of a poem and, and I have to 
hear it, cry, and I have to feel it rhythmically. And as a consequence, I, I like being in a room that has some acoustics to it. Uh, so if you, if I, if I clap or make some noises, there, there's a nice reverberation. And that's similar to, I, I play guitar, and it's similar to sitting inside the body of a guitar. Right? And you get that full resonance. And I just, my in efforts at trying to write poems are bodily like that. <clears throat> and so this is a, a poem that kind of reflects on that. And some of you may have seen a number 10 galvanized wash tub. It's about, it's the big one. Um, that maybe your, your grandparents or great grandparents would have washed clothes in it <clears throat> if they were living in certain places. That's called a number 10 wash tub. So the name of the poem is I've got those mean old number 10 wash tub blues. Everything is a metaphor. Even the bent over heads of grass that's gone to seed and the sway they make and the rhythm of the swaying, devoted little emblems of green. Sometimes I turn the wash tub over when I think a rain is coming in to let the rain thump the bottom of the tub. A nice, low, sleepy sound, depending on the rain. I enjoy that kind of truth. The daydream wanders into the light. More often, however, the wash tub only hangs by its handle from a nail in the barn, and the tub is mute, except when it catches from the distance the old man farther down the way, calling his cows home for the night with a high-pitched woo and whoop, and the open tub cradles his voice and lulls it lightly back as if a hymn is being sounded out. It isn't despair I hear in his voice, but I like to hear the lonely in it and how the wash tub makes it ring. An old man's voice and a wash tub, a daydream making its way to the light. Very particular instruments. We might as well add a spice bush to the scene and work it into the low refrain, the thumping low refrain, depending on the ringing rain. One of the things that Crystal Wilkinson and I have, one of the many things we have in common is wisdom we learn from our grandparents. And, um, not just wisdom of country life uh, and living close to the land, but also a particular facility for language uh, and just the, the natural storytelling of, a, of our older generations. And this is a poem reflecting on that three old mountain women. They were country beauties in their time, but I knew them when they were old, wearing straight dark dresses below the knee, absolved of passion what little there had been, because the women I'm thinking of, my kin, were practical. Mothers of children, the rearing, the little patch of land, and their continuance what they were born to, a hard place, a people. Above all, they were gardeners, green down to their being roots, and roots in the spreading ground below their calm countenance, when sitting in a straight-backed chair, a voice prompted them to tell a tale, and then they told it plainly, aware I sometimes thought of what effect hearing the tale would have on me. 
But now I think I merely needed a voice, a voice suspended in the air. Well, I declare it, and together they gave it to me. All this business with language is uh, that I've thought about as my from my own childhood and maybe polished a little bit through education. Uh, the fascination I have with the sound and rhythm of language is kind of making a full circle in my life because my wife and I have a three-year-old who's really just picking up language now. And um, she likes to rhyme, all kinds of really interesting stuff. So I'm, I'm getting to see all of this from, a, from her experience, and I, I really treasure that experience. So this is a little bit about her learning to speak. Uh, this is called the Gospel of Music. You have to thank the great beyond if your child delights in birdsong, especially a chorus of it. A dizzy crowd of birds singing, warbles, chits and caws ringing through the sanctuary of the woods. Although I heard the birds myself, it was the little one who pointed her finger to the budding trees and pronounced the word she has for music, composed of a pair of syllables both beginning vaguely with Y, with emphasis rightly on the first. It also happens to be the word she has for donkey, and the plural of donkey. And it's also the word she says regarding the photograph of an old-time banjo player she sees at supper time. She sees the sound of a silent instrument, and that's the true gospel of music. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was music, and birds, and donkeys, and God was a serious banjo player with an inscrutable face, who said to everything alive, I made the world for singing, now you sing. may know that a nickname for either of the Carolinas is a Kakalaki. Anybody ever hear of that? Probably derives from an Indian language. Um, and a uh, yard bird is a, another name for a rooster or chicken. This is called a Kakalaki yard bird reconsidered. An old ancestor of mine ventured to one of the Carolinas once in order to retrieve a rooster. It was a journey there and back, uphill in both directions, the kind of going forth that leads to a tale requiring embellishment, a grim appraisal of the human condition, and a pretty little barefoot gal who almost swayed the author from his task to bring the rooster home. There was even a witch somewhere in there, but the author liked to tell the tale a different way each time, as if he knew a story has to change. He called his rooster Lion Tom, because the author had observed a rooster cannot abide the truth. Now the man I've called the author was indeed the author of the tale, but he was in the tale, you see, and so the author of his fate. He had a scheme that reached beyond the tail, to travel far to find a yard bird from the furnace place a feller ever could imagine, and thus the chance to make a boast, common in those distant days, but sure to bring the company of strangers curious to see the fine fangled preening bird. The story sprouted like a seed, and Lion Tom became a legend and the author got to tell the tale. That was the reason I realize now, with, foggy, with the foggy wisp of time twitching like a spider silk behind the tail. 
for fetching the bird at all. The loneliness a man could feel even at home, even when love is all around. This old timer liked to gamble, I am told, on the top of a coffin lid. Making coffins was his trade. And passing out in one was not uncommon, given the, the, that the cards went hand in hand with imbibery. And yet, he aimed to be redeemed eventually. The Lord would swoop from out of nowhere like a hawk, or flutter gentle as a dove to bring the broken human soul together again and make it sing. His tale was always about redemption, but no one ever sees it coming, not even the author of the tale. Reckon I'm on my way, he said, one night in the dead heat of summer. I just don't know it yet. He smiled and spread his cards out in the dark, symbolically on the coffin lid, about the time old Lion Tom crowed in the day on the early side, when the stars were still high in the sky and the hillsides were holding time like a ladle full of soup. But Lion Tom was a useful bird. He filled the air with invention. And when you live in such a sleepy place, invention is what you have to do. It gives you something to talk about if any strangers happen by and loneliness is in their eyes. I'm going to read a slightly body poem <clears throat> because my wife is not here and not object. <clears throat> After all these years, my woman's done got voluptuous. <laughs> Life changes. Things come and go. And things that never were before delightfully appear. One thing that pleases me, delectatio profundo, to give it classical freight, is what I'll nicely call increase. A rich bounty now lies abed, and I have feasted on the spread. Previously there was a wiggle, modest, comely, yet add to that in time's sweet passage, lo, a jiggle, and the situation suggests a panting painting, which, ah, where, ah, the birds do sing, and the beloved's less a little thing. She will, when I get home, she will say, did you read that poem? <laughs> So uh, I'll do two more, and then if you have some questions, I'll be happy to answer them. My left side. My left side is kinked and painful in the neck and shoulder, in the hip, and that's the side for most of what I do in hammering or raising above the left foot a shovel to move the gritty dirt from high, upended ground and level it. Or to begin with stacking rocks, I start on the left to make a wall, or move a wall already there. Or shoring the barn, I begin on the left, uphill. Or when I sing in praise, or from an anguish I can't let fly like a ragged crow over the hill, I turn my head slightly to the left because it helps me hear the song and when to put the hiccup in the voice and let it lope along like a tramp. And sometimes I just look to the left to see if something's there, if the figure entering the woods halfway through the heartsick chorus with his left hand raised is me. Um, this last poem is called A Little Red Book and the, this, it's not of terrible interest but the book that I'm specifically referring to here is a, is a very thin book that I found in a used bookstore and it's called um, Poetry and Art by a French 
philosopher from the mid 20th century named Jacques Maritain. It's a really interesting little book. One that I bought when I was a student at UK and thought I was doing something sophisticated and I did not understand it for years and probably still don't. But I still like to open the book and visit it. A little red book, red, the color red. But also, <laughs> rarely read. A little red book. All is danger in this growth of being alone and not alone. On the wet, redeeming path in the woods, or the wordless study of solitude that follows the path invisibly. Whatever is in the mind rattles, but then it too becomes absorbed after a few unsteady steps and stops listening to itself. So I listen to the world and see it, but that is the world. Today the world is raining. I'm not raining myself, though the sound of fingers thrumming a table in the sky is pleasing to my ear. Today the world is rainy and grayish with patches of white. It isn't yet what it's going to be. The world is always becoming something else. It won't be still, and yet it has the feeling of being constant, especially if from a distance you see some hills. For days and days they seem the same, remote and rounded and blurrier the farther you see, and thus more likely to seem unchanging. Art, I think, must offer more than mere appearance. The world is more than mere appearance. It's vastly more. Try listening to rain and see what you think. It's like having a little red book whose spine is cracked and you crack it open one more time and there before you is something else to think about. If it has symbolic meaning, it's still too soon to tell, but you study it as if the sun is coming out or a long empty pond is filled and a butterfly that should have been battered to nothing is rising from the grass. Yeah, if, um, I'll be happy to answer some questions or recommend things for you to do in your spare time. Well, I think we should definitely start with recommendations. Um, uh, learn to identify 25 species of trees. Learn to identify the wildflowers native to your region of the world. Learn to identify birds by their song. Just try it. You don't have to do it tonight. It's a, it is so, I suggest this, in fact, two of my former wonderful students over at Trancy are now over here in the creative writing program at UCK. Uh, and um, I may have suggested this to, to Dane and Tierra before. There's something really satisfying about walking into the woods and saying, that's a tulip poplar, um, or uh, that's a pawpaw tree. Um, it's just, you feel like you belong in the world, because you're, because you know it. That's, that's all the wisdom I have to share. Do you have like a poem that's your favorite, or that when you look at it, you get a little emotional, or, or, or that you feel like it's too personal to share that you just kind of wrote it to yourself? A poem of my own that is my favorite? You know, I don't. Uh, I have had occasions when I've been reading a poem 
it has that I have a personal attachment to and I get caught off guard and get a little choked up. Especially reading um, anything that I've written about my daughter because I'm an old guy with a young child and it's a totally different experience than being a young guy with a young child, I think. Uh, um, but I, um, one time I was invited to give a little presentation at the Library of Congress, uh, and it was, they just wanted me to read some poems by Kentucky born writer Robert Penn Warren, who, if you don't know, is, some of you, I'm sure, have read All the King's Men, his great novel that the Kentucky Humanities Council is spending a year um, going around the state with different forums discussing the novel. But he, Warren was also a really interesting poet. And so I, I was, I decided to read a couple of his later poems, one of which is called Red Tail Hawk and Pyre of Youth. I, I, I recommend, if you're interested in poetry, just go find that poem. It's such a moving poem, and it's, it's, it's about many things. Um, but I, it, and it's a poem that spoke to me when I first read it, when I was a student here, living out in a one-room schoolhouse in Anderson County. Um, and I can remember reading that poem in 1990 or so and thinking, this is, this is the kind of poem that I want to write myself. Um, so when I read it 27 years later at the Library of Congress, I, I wasn't expecting it, but I just lost it. And there was, there was, there's a moment in the poem where uh, the line is, and the hawk rose up. And I, I, did, I could, just felt it. Felt the poem was alive. And it, 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 it inhabited me for a moment. That doesn't happen very often. But when it does, it's a good thing. Yes, sir. You alluded to this a little bit. You got the risk of inviting us to take the visit. I'm wondering how uh, Father, Father, uh, recently in the life, how you feel that's changed your poetry and your approach to poetry and your way to support that from a big moment in life. Uh, it, it, it has changed many things. <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, I don't want to get morbid here, but, um, you know, when my daughter is 30, it's likely I won't be here. Um, yeah, I guess I could be, but boy, I'd be an old fella. Um, and um, I realize this is something I can leave her, uh, along with our farm. But. Um, I don't know that I'll that I'll have the chance to speak to her deeply the way a parent passes wisdom to a child uh, under ordinary circumstances, and a, you know a parent is often there for his or her child well into the child's adulthood, uh, and maybe the child's having children, so um, it seems some, somewhat unlikely that that will be the case for me, and so this is, I'm, I'm just aware this will, this will be the way Lillian knows Daddy one of these days, maybe.
I try not to think about that stuff because it's freaking <laughs> depressing. <laughs> I, I, I'll be 82 in 30 years, so that's, that's, oh, I can probably pull that off. If I keep eating my fiber. <laughs> yeah, work, being outside will keep you, keep you honest. Um, the, the question was, what, what poets have I read out loud where I'm hearing the line? And, um, Seamus Heaney, Robert Frost, Welsh poet R.S. Thomas, um, American poet Edwin Arlington Robinson. Um, before that, um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, um, and some Wordsworth. There's, this is something I struggle to articulate because it is such a eccentric thing in a way. Um, but I, I try to say to my students, let's, um, let's write a poem that one would like to hear um, rather than read. Does that make sense? Um, there are some poems that just, that's not the way they are intended to work though so you know it's, it's this isn't a one-size-fits-all idea but I and I also um, lately have realized that in English <clears throat> um, all of most of the, the the vocabulary we have for bodily things like fist clap slap um, bang and then words for physical things like trunk and stone. Um, those words all originate in the Anglo-Saxon side of English. The words that we have for our moods and our states of mind come to us from Latin. So there's this, does that make sense? Um, so there's this, and I, I picked up some of this from studying Seamus Heaney for sure. He he's really demonstrates it, and, and a, a poet, yeah, Heaney's language, it just sounds like you're tuning through static on the radio in the old days of static on the radio, right? It's popping and crackling um, rather than humming. Um, and so much of his vocabulary is this Anglo-Saxon, because they were just violent people, right? They, they, they beat up their enemies instead of talk to them. Right? <laughs> or they, you know, they were physically involved in the world through work, labor. Um, their, their language is more embodied um, and more physical. Um, rather than the language of the mind is, is um, doesn't have the same sound properties, if that makes sense. <laughs> Yes, sir. Can you share with us some mistakes we can avoid? 
can you share some mistakes that we can avoid? Some mistakes you can yeah, avoid? Yeah, mistakes for writing code. Yeah. That's a dangerous question. Um, well, I, I, can I can tell you one thing that um, is pedagogically valuable about taking a creative writing course is you, you learn some techniques, you learn um, uh, say what, what imagery really is and how it works, what a simile really is and how it works, what a metaphor is and how it works. Um, when I was in college, we didn't have creative writing, so for years I was just trying to figure this stuff out. Um, and um, so I think the, the introduction of creative writing into a college setting is, is really a good thing. Um, it, it, it makes your learning the craft hopefully more efficient. You know, it, it doesn't make it easy, and it doesn't make you write great work, but it gives you the tools in a, in a, to, to do serious work in um, an efficient way. Um, other, other things, um, recommendations, I guess. It's kind of a, a two-headed beast. One, um, if there's a, a particular poet that s some people are talking about and are saying, oh, this, is a, this poet is great. You've got to read this poet's work. And you do, and you really don't care for it, that's okay. You, you, you don't have to you're not obligated to like what everybody else likes. Um, but on the other hand, um, you, you might kind of pass on a poet for a while and then come back to that same poet and realize, oh, wait a minute, I was, I was overlooking something here. Um, How's that? <clears throat> so, um, in the class session, uh, we talked a lot about your distinction and the... I'm sorry, can you help me? Just say that, start over here. <laughs> uh, in the class session, uh, we've been talking a lot about your distinction that you use. My class. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. And I was wondering, how did you realize that you had a fiction or that you were, was it like you were raised around that fiction and how did you realize like, that it was different, I guess, from other things? Does that make sense? Yes, good to, I get that often, a uh, question like that. Um, well, um, the poems that I read in high school classes, um, you know, had the quality of being official, you know, uh, almost like most of the time written in a very polished English, very elevated. Um, and I mean, that's, that's just one of the one of the nice things about education is, thank goodness, it changes. How we do it, how we present things changes in, in classes. And it, it obviously needs to, um, because encountering poetry is this very stiff and formal, starched thing. Um, it didn't put me off, but it made me think I don't have a place in it. Is that clear? Um, one 
about this time of year when I was a senior in high school, my very sweet high school English teacher, who's still cooking at about 89, uh, <clears throat> she came, she, we were getting ready to go for Christmas break, and she said, I want y'all to just hear a, hear a poem. She did not give the name of the, the title of the poem or the name of the poet. And she started reading this thing, and I, my jaw dropped open, and I thought, that sounds like my grandmother. Um, and I thought for years of the poem as I just invented a title for it. I called it The Ballad of Lomi Carter. Because that there was a woman in the poem named Lomi Carter, and another woman named Sally Ann Barton. And the poem was gothic, it's gothic, there's a double murder ballad thing going on, and a ghost story, all just kind of woven together. But it was all in uh, a southeastern Kentucky hillbilly dialect, which is where my grandmother was from. And I, I thought, you mean people write poems in this language? I, it, was, it was really a revelation. And I just kept that, just the few lines from that poem in my head, for, I'm sure, close to 30 years. And then I realized one day, oh, there's this thing called the internet. <laughs> and so I typed in Lomi Carter, and boom, there it was. And the poem is called Old Christmas by a guy named Roy Helton, who nobody talks about anymore. But I've talked about this poem other places, and people of a certain generation recall that poem from their junior high days and things in the, in the 40s and 50s or something like that. So that was that was important to feel like um, you know it, it, any writer, depending regardless of where you come from and what your background is, I think you need you need to find permission somewhere from some source. It may come from a teacher, it may come from um, uh, an educational experience or uh, something like that. But it's, it is really empowering to feel like you can you can, you have a seat at the table. Is that good? Thank you all.